And there you have it. Good morning, good morning. This is your host, Dr. Deb Carlin here at The K Factor, where K equals kindness and the factors are all the things that lead to it. And today, you'll notice I am solo. Our co-host, my co-host, our good friend, Richard Flint is taking a few days off. We hope that he will be back with us a week from today. But in his absence, I have a request that we all put some really good, loving energy in his direction and wish him everything perfect and well and magnificent. He is a wonderful co-host. And if you're here listening, I have no doubts. It's because you're a big fan of his. I know I am. And it's been a blessing to have him as a partner on this show. You know, one of the things that Richard and I started talking about was Tuesday talks, just coming together and talking about all the things that both of us are concerned about in terms of the human condition. But after we were doing it for a month or so, he said, you know, how about if we rename this show, No Apologies, and we have open and honest discussion here every single week to get people really thinking about the ways in which we've got to stop apologizing. (laughs) And what I mean by that is not apologizing to one another in our personal realms about an injury or an insult or, you know, something that was um, accidental and we hurt one another's feelings or we somehow bumped into one another and it was not okay or same in a business relationship. But how about if we stop apologizing for the things that are our convictions, that are our values, that are the core of who we are as human beings, as good, upright, upstanding human beings who believe in core American values? How about if we believe in God and we don't apologize for these things? You know, that that probably is the thing that he and I have focused on the most because in 2020, it seems to us that something has taken a major shift. Now, it's like it's not like it hasn't been brewing for a while, but something very interesting has happened, hasn't it? You know, things are rolling along fine and and we have no wars and and the stock market's doing really well and unemployment is really low and employment for people and demographics that have never had it so good are on the rise and looks like looks like peace and happiness looks like the American dream. It looks like life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness was really present. We get this we get this Wuhan virus and so why don't we stop calling it COVID-19 and let's go back to the origins and talk about the ways in which from the very get-go we knew from whence this came and it came from China and it is called the Wuhan the Wuhan virus and it comes here and we identify it and it's number 19 out of a string of viruses that we have successfully successfully dealt with over a long period of time. But this somehow drives things differently than what we've ever seen in our country before and around the world. How is that even possible? This is not the bubonic plague. Yes, people have died, but do you know it hovers right around 200,000 deaths here in the United States and the vast majority of people who have gotten this virus have not died. They have recovered. No illness, even a bad cold or the flu is very uncomfortable. I work hard to keep my immune system boosted because I do not appreciate succumbing to any moment when I don't feel well. But let's put it in perspective. I heard a gentleman last night, and I don't know if this is appropriate uh, statistics or not, but he said, I understand that we've had 200,000 people die of the coronavirus in the United States this year, but do you understand that we've had 300,000 abortions of black babies through Planned Parenthood this year? Now, 
I don't know if that's true because it didn't fact check it, but it raised a question in my mind because the thing that I keep focusing on is twofold. How many deaths have there really been? How many positives have there really been with the tests that were not false positives? And how many times has somebody died from a complication being the coronavirus, the Wuhan virus, but they had so many other disorders, meaning comorbidities, that that's what really swiped them of their life? It's an important question to contemplate because the reaction has been so severe. Wear a mask, social distance, don't congregate, close your congregations or at least really limit what you can do within your congregations. Change the workplace. Allow businesses to be shut down. This is very intense. And I'd like to know while you're sitting there, what do you think of all that? When you sit there in contemplation and you consider that whole long list of things I just ran off, What's your reaction to that? Well, let me back up a little bit or move into the side lane. I can tell you what it's, excuse me, done for us nationally. The increase in the number of prescriptions requested and prescribed for anxiety and depression have really skyrocketed. Suicides have really skyrocketed. We have a nation of people, and by the way, my description of a nation of people here in America is that we have people who are an entrepreneurial spirit. We have people who are cooperatives. We have people who are loving and strong and durable, and we love our freedom, and we want our freedoms enjoyed each and every day. So when everything is shut down, and we're squeezed tight, and we're told how to breathe through this mask, and stay away from people, and you can't go to see people who you love her in the hospital, they're isolated away from you, they die away from you. Same with people who are our seniors, the most wise part of our population that carries the history, that's witnessed so much that we need to get the wisdom from. We're isolated from them. Too many of them have died. I wonder what the actual figure is on how many of them have died. And not just from the coronavirus, but died from the loneliness and the despair and the actual diagnosis of a broken heart. There's a technical name for it, but it's really dying of a broken heart. We need one another, my friends. So what is your reaction to all of this? I invite you to think about it and to reach out to Richard Flint and I, Deb at drdebcarlin.com, Richard Flint, uh, rflint at aol.com. Now we need one another. We need the, the, the closeness in physical proximity. We need the hugs and the love. We need the facial expression exchange. I miss being out and seeing the whole face of people who are around me. And you can't see everything through the eyes. We need to see the whole face. So what are your thoughts about that? What are your thoughts about the ways in which if you Google this and you look at photos of infants in America, in the nurseries, in the hospital, post-birth, newborns, wearing masks. Wow. And then the care providers come in and they're wearing masks. That's called sensory deprivation. That's called interrupting the process of learning. Facial recognition is an early part of our development and it's an important part of it. Let's take it out a little bit further. Right now, the end of October, I think today is the 27th of October we have cities across the country shutting down again. What are we going to do about that? They're shutting down again, just when people were starting to come back and vibrant. Well, the weather's getting cold. That doesn't help. 
but indoor, indoor dining has now been shut down in several big cities across the country. How far is that going to go? And what sort of what sort of feelings does that stir in you? And what sort of plans are you making for how you want to protect yourself so you've got food enough from the grocery? How are you taking care of yourself in terms of your plans for this Halloween and for Thanksgiving? And what are your thoughts about what's happening with this election that's going to happen a week from today, as a matter of fact? Do you know who it is that you're going to vote for? Are you decided on that? And in your decision, are you comfortable? Do you feel safe? Are you voting an absentee ballot? Did you already vote? Are you voting in person? I'm voting in person tomorrow. I do not want to be at the election poll the day of the election. It just um, puts me in a state of discomfort, and I'd rather not put my state, myself into a state of discomfort at any point in time. Yesterday was a really pivotal day for the United States of America. We saw the swearing in of the most recent incredibly qualified Amy Coney Barrett into the United States Supreme Court. And as Richard and I talked about this, our conversation included how incredibly impressed we were with this young woman's intellectual ability, her stellar memory, her ability to articulate very clearly and very calmly as she was under tremendous fire, a lot of insult. As she was being interviewed for the position. Now, here's what I thought was really interesting. When I watched the hearing that very first day, my anticipation is this is an interview for a candidate. But yet, she didn't have an opportunity to say much because what I witnessed was a lot of big poster boards and photographs and then people coming in who were on that interview panel with tall stacks of materials, reference materials, staff around them. And they, they threw out information and told her all kinds of things they weren't there to hear her. They were there to hear themselves pontificate. And I was taken aback by that because I thought to myself, I showed up here because I'd like to hear from her, not from you. You have your own platform. This is not an appropriate time for this. Why don't you ask her the questions? And then when on subsequent days, there really was questions posed it was amazing to me the way that she has data stored in her mind that she could pull from easily. She didn't bring any books in with her. She didn't bring any notes written. She held up a pad of paper, as a matter of fact, at one point in time and showed everybody she didn't have anything on there. But she did take a couple of notes in order to, I guess, make a note and keep track of something that she wanted to be able to respond to, maybe jog something in her memory, I don't know. I watched and I felt, I thought embarrassed and I shared that with a colleague and they said, no, not embarrassed, ashamed. I don't wanna feel ashamed of anybody in our culture. I don't want to feel ashamed of myself and I don't want to feel ashamed of my fellow citizens, particularly our leadership, but I do. And when this young woman was sworn in last night at, at, the, at the White House and I watched that evening ceremony, I felt pride again and proud and hopeful that somebody who knows our, our sacred documents in this country the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights and 
all the law. That there's somebody there who has got extreme integrity. And that's not to say that anybody else on the Supreme Court doesn't, but it was one more member being added who has all that. And how does she feel and what does she think? We'll never really know about the ways in which she was treated as she was walking into that in the line of fire. I wonder if any of these people are going to end up having to come to her for a question. In my imagination, I envision that she will be quite the lady and very elegant and very, very scholarly with them and give them correct information and never be swayed or bought, but will follow the law. Why is it that we are a nation divided and we have got to have so much acrimony that we're being forced to witness right now. What I know is I repel the acrimony. I repel the idea that our country needs to be broken down and dismantled, that our statues and our monuments need to be desecrated, that we need graffiti anywhere, that we need censorship anywhere, that we need violence in the streets that we need chanting and marching, that we need our police to fund it. I defy all of that and disagree with all of that. In order to be a civilization, it means that you need a civil society where people are polite, they obey the law, they listen to the police. When people are in a position of authority, you don't argue with them. When they tell you to pull out your wallet, you do. When they tell you to stop, you do. If we can't get back to a place of trust and also a place of learning that there are consequences for our actions, we're not civilized society. We're not safe. We need to be able to exercise our freedoms, our boundaries within the parameters of what it is that's acceptable and not acceptable. It seems that we have got um, espionage and under the table deals and things that seem to me treasonous happening. I say that with kind of a question because I'm shrinking while I'm saying that because I certainly have a hard time believing that that's really taking place. And we have people who are running for president of the United States surrounded by people who are saying, we don't believe in the United States government as a capitalist society. We're tired of the old white men running it. We don't believe in the sanctity of the American family, the nuclear family unit. Now, wait a second, isn't, isn't that common about white men? Isn't that discriminatory? Isn't that racist? Because it sure is to my ears and to my heart. I've been on a platform for 20 years talking about the discrimination against the white male in America and that it really needs to stop. That's my father. Those are my uncles. Those are my cousins. Those are my brothers. Those are my friends and my business partners. <laughs> Those are the men of my engagement. I think we need to stop. Let's stop looking at color. Let's stop looking at age. Let's all be deferential to one another. Let's be kind. This is the K factor. Where K equals kindness and the factors are all the things that lead to it. <laughs> and as, as, I'm, as I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about all the ways in which, what if today every one of us was kind enough to ourself to be discerning? Thinking through clearly what our choices are. Stop being critical of who the leader is, if they have behaviors you don't approve of, 
that they engage in? What are their policies? What's their integrity behind all that? What are the things that are the actual acts that they've engaged in that are legal or illegal? What are the things that are nefarious? What are the things that are generous? What are the things that are false and what are the things that are sincere? Now granted, <coughs> excuse me, granted in today's culture, it's kind of hard to tell, but there's a lot of evidence out there for you. We need peace, don't we? I've made my decision. I know who I'm voting for. I hope that you've made your decision and that you stand tall in it, that you feel proud in it. And then whatever it is that happens on the backside of this election, and regardless of the turnout, I pray that we have peace because we are literally dying for it. I hope our children get to go back to school. I cannot believe that we are going to have a nation of children who went for close to a year without being in real school and being involved in real playful time and that we have parents on lockdown and seniors isolated and all this unhealthiness. I had said from the very beginning in January, it is not the coronavirus, the Wuhan virus, that scares me in terms of the germs. What absolutely terrifies me is what I see coming. The social psychological impact of how all of this is interpreted. I live in a different paradigm from the norm when it comes to health and well being and health care and health insurance and hospitals and physician relationships. And I've lived my life that way. I believe that our self-care is what we need to be taught a whole lot more of. And not to be so dependent on the things that right now are not doing us any really big favors. So when you go into your mind and into your conscience, a few prayers from me to you from Richard and I to you as the co-hosts of this show. Today's episode, sponsored by Partners in Excellence. And that's what I'd like us all to be here. We're partnering and we're reaching for the best. Let's give a big shout out to Richard. Send him an email, send him a text and say, best wishes for you today, Richard Flint. We all love you. We need you. We hope you're back next week. And on that note, I'm going to say peace out. Thank you for being here today. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>